Hey friends, Jason here, the host of the Speak With People podcast. Before we hop into this episode of the Lead With People, Not At Them series, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to speak like a leader? So many of us aren't ready to answer that because we don't think we have the confidence. We're too fearful or we just aren't given the opportunities to speak in public. And maybe if we do, we don't understand how to put our thoughts together in a clear way and then all the nerves attack us, the beads of sweat and the ums and our stomach turns over. It's time to end all of that. Speak With People is introducing a brand new course called Speak Like a Leader. This is for the everyday leader to speak with confidence, clarity, and in a captivating way. You are going to be absolutely ready when your boss says, hey, can you give an update on the project you've been working on in front of the team? You're going to stand up with confidence. You're going to be clear, and you're going to captivate that room. You're going to close more sales. You're going to be able to communicate more clearly. You're going to be able to deepen your relationships because you're going to speak like a leader. This includes nine different modules, all of the training videos that you can watch on your own, all of the different worksheets, and then additional worksheets. It also includes two private coaching sessions with me. Go to speakwithpeople.com slash speak like a leader and get your course today. And now for this episode of the Lead with People, Not at Them series. Well, welcome to the Speak with People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'm so excited that you are joining us today. We believe that healthy communication is oxygen for our relationships and our leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one to a team from a stage or like I am right now from behind a screen, we hope that our time today will challenge you, encourage you, and inspire you to communicate in healthy ways. And really when you do that, you really will change your world with your worlds. Well, we are continuing this series on the Speak With People podcast called Lead With People. Just been an incredible series. Our guests have provided such amazing insight. Uh, Just been so grateful for that. But if you've missed the free leadership companion guide, that's filled with leadership principles from over 25 leaders from around the country. Make sure you go to speakwithpeople.com slash lead with people and download your copy today. Well, in this uh, week in the series, I have the privilege of sitting down, having a conversation with a leader in the field of business and sales. He's a Harvard business professor and the world has gone through gigantic communication shifts over the years, especially in business and sales. And so we get to just have a conversation about some of those shifts and how we can approach selling uh, our communication and do it better in 2023 and beyond. I'm working through a couple of his books. He's an author. He's written tons of articles, but I'm just so uh, grateful that he's taken the time to be on the podcast uh, welcome, Frank. Thank you so much for being on the Speak of People podcast. Well, Jason, my uh, thanks go to you for hosting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I absolutely love it. Well, for our audience to kind of keep getting to know you, could you give us just a little bit about your story? You know, I, I kind of gave them a little bit, but, you know, fill in some of the holes, who you are, what you do, all that kind of stuff. My, uh, my background is not particularly uh, exotic. You know, I got my um, a PhD. I started teaching at Harvard's Business School uh, made my way up the hierarchy, and then after 10 years with some others, I uh, started a business. Uh, mm. I left uh, academia, ran that business for another uh, 10 years, and got lucky. You know, when <laughs> when need be, I can spin this a different way, but the truth <laughs> is it was luck. We sold at exactly the right time. Um, Harvard's Business School called me back up, said, how'd you like to be a professor again? And uh, trust me, Jason, being a professor at a decent school after you've made good money is a good life. I have Mm. no complaints, but that's that's my backstory. Oh, I love that. I love that. I uh, years ago, I had started uh, an MBA. I I did not finish it. Multiple children came and uh, three of our children have a rare uh, genetic uh, disorder. And so our life is just kind of crazy. At some point, I'm going to finish it. But the the couple of years that I did work on it, read so many Harvard Business Review articles. So I'm sure that in that time, I read, uh, you know, at least one of yours way back then. But uh, I was looking over the list of your articles, and uh, you have you've had a few of them published there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm uh, um, my hunch is I'm old enough, and you're young enough that yeah, you probably read a couple of those articles <laughs> I wrote. <laughs> Well, I love it. Well, you have written uh, a lot about sales and you've written, you know, a couple of books. You've your your most recent book is sales management that works. You wrote a book about 10 years ago about uh, actually this book, aligning uh, strategy in sales. And so you've kind of honed in on that area. 
you know, the world has just, I mean, it's just crazy to think about how much we've changed technologically and how fast everything is advancing. I'm just wondering from your point of view, how can businesses, you know, <laughs> you know, either A, effectively embrace all of this, you know, technology, the digital transformation, or B, even keep up, you know, how can we, how can we step into that, especially in 2023 and beyond? I mean, just a couple of comments about that. First of all, you know, that phrase, digital transformation, you can drive a truck through that phrase, right? I mean, what does it mean? It's used to mean virtually anything that happens to touch a computer or an iPhone or, or an iPad or whatever. And when the phrase is stretched that broadly, it becomes almost meaningless, right? Mm -hmm. So that's number one. You got to bring it down to earth. Number two is I think people overestimate how much is digital. I can mm. give, let me give you and our um, audience an example. If you look at um, e-commerce, right? E-commerce is not new. It's been around over 30 years. Right. People forget this, but books.com was selling books online nationally while Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, was still working for a hedge fund huh. in New York, right? But after 30 plus years, just before the pandemic, what was e-commerce, including Amazon, as a percentage of total retail sales? And the answer is about 11%. Mm. Now, when I ask executives, you know, I don't tell them the number. When I ask them, what do you think that number was? I routinely get estimates from 30 to 60%. In other words, executives, wow. forget MBAs, they think it's 100%. <laughs> right. But executives outrageously overestimate this core fact about buying. What happened during the pandemic? Obviously, when stores are closed or held to 50% of capacity, or when people feel if they go to a store, they may catch a virus and bad things will happen, there's going to be more online buying and selling. Yep. The height of e-commerce as a percentage of retail sales during the pandemic was 16 and a half percent. In other words, it went up about 6% and it's wow. gone down 15 since then. The point I want to make is this. Wow. It is not a digital eats physical world. That is hmm. a fallacy. But this is a big deal, not because digital is replacing in person. Shopping and buying has been a social as well as economic experience for millennia a once in a century pandemic doesn't change that mm. but what digital does is make a big big difference in the information available to prospects and buyers and that's a big deal for sales marketing business development whatever you want to call that core activity yep. in business yep because really at the end of the day it's still a you know, it's a people business. I mean, it's, and so at, at the end of it, somebody is buying it. And so you've got to understand who the, who the person buying it is. I mean, we've got to yeah. understand who yeah, that but, person is. But, but I think what you also have to understand, and this is where I think, uh, you know, digital transformation just befuddles uh, <laughs> a lot of clear decision-making. Yeah. The most important thing about selling is and always has been the buyer, not mm. the seller. Mm. but the buyer. And that's where the new digital technologies make their biggest impact. Yeah. Right. I mean, buyers now get information about the products and services they're interested in from many, many sources of information besides a salesperson or a company's website. They get it from influencers. They get it, you know, in many B2B businesses, they get it from user yep. forums who give them unfiltered information, et cetera. So the days of salespeople basically being, you know, sort of organic walking, talking versions right. of product and price information, <clears throat> those days are dead right. because the buyer can get that information with one or two clicks. That's the biggest impact of digital that's going on. Wow. Wow. So with that, then, is the salesperson in 2023 and beyond, do they have to be better than 
uh, a better people person or a better people leader than ever before because before like you said they had to they, they were the experts and now you know it, is it almost reversed a little where they have to be the experts in people so they they get to the person's story you know what their dreams are you know all that kind of stuff yeah. well i think i think good salespeople have always been good with mm. people yeah. right i mean you know that that's just built in yeah. uh, to the activity um in some sense, they do have to be even better. And the reason, of course, is that they have less time with the prospect. And there's less of the, what I would call, background that's part of the sales task. They have to add more value in less time mm. with the people they're speaking to. So in that sense, the bar is rising, but that shouldn't surprise us. That's that's. That's the glory of capitalism. That's right. that's what a good free market does. It's right. constantly raising the bar uh, for the ability to persuade customers to buy your product and service rather than the alternatives. Sales just happens to be exhibit A for that in the current technology revolution. Yeah. So a little off script here, not a question that I provided you, but just as you're talking, I, it's just coming to mind. Um, so, you know, we, it's an interesting day. We have so many generations in the workforce together. You know, the boomers, Gen X, and millennials, and Gen Z, they all communicate, you know, in different ways. Uh, you know, my oldest is 23. Then I got a 21-year-old. You know, they, they always talk about, ooh, you know, I don't want to be around people too much. Oh, boy, there's too much people. Um, but how, how is this, this younger generation, uh, how are they going to adapt, especially – if they go into sales, if, you know, they're a little bit thrown off by, uh, you know, people, you know, wanting to be around people. Because you've got the boomers who will hop on a phone call and let's talk this thing out. And then you've got, like you just talked about, the, the, the time span is just shrinking. So those Gen Zers are like, tell it to me, get right to it. And if I don't have to talk to you, that's great. Let's just all do it over, you know. Yeah. How are things adapting yeah. that way? Well, I'll, I'll make, um, you know, uh, I'll make a couple of comments yeah. uh, about that. You, you know, the old saying, uh, predictions are risky, especially about the future, right? The predictions <laughs> about the past are easy, uh, but I'm pretty sure they'll adapt. Number one, there is a sense in which the situation you described is not new. Um, here's some data that, um, again, our listeners might find interesting. Um, the last time I looked, which is about four years ago when I started writing that most recent book that you were kind enough to mention, of the over 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, less than 300 even offered a sales course, wow. let alone a sales program, wow. right? Um, so this is a line of work where the vast majority of people start out knowing almost nothing mm. about what they're going to get paid for. And that's always been true. And it's true today, whether you're millennial, Gen Z, geriatric, or whatever. This is a line of work that is, that is about learning by doing. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's number one. Number two is I wouldn't, I, I think we tend to exaggerate you know, there's always, once you reach the age of 45 or above, Jason, there's always that, oh, these kids today kind of thing, right? <laughs> uh, that was true of what uh, people said about your generation, my generation. The phrase generation gap is about 70 years old. Right. right. Think about it that way. So I wouldn't overestimate um, or exaggerate yeah. the differences. Good. It's a very, very good book that was published last year called Generations by a sociologist in England. And I think he documents um, that the differences in the way people consume information, relate to each other, are not that different mm. by generation. I'd also point out the obvious thing. People in their 20s are going to be in their 30s in 10 years, right? Watch your <laughs> kids. Uh, it's inevitable. Yep. The point that I want to make, though, and where I think it gets uh, tactically back to your question, those people who go into sales are going to have to go through the same process 
that their parents did, their grandparents, their great grandparents, etc. You learn by doing. Mm. Now, the difference is that people entering sales today simply have many, many more media and much more data available to them and their customers. And that's the difference. But I don't think the difference resides mm. in some DNA that you inherit when you're Gen Z versus Gen R or mm. whatever. Yes. It's about what's going on in the external marketplace. And, you know, I guarantee you some will adapt and some will not, but that's yes. been true for about a thousand years. Yes. You, you talk about, it was so fascinating. Uh, you know, especially this generation has more data available to them. I just saw a news report. They were um, uh, looking at the Detroit Lions Stadium. I'm a lifelong Lions fan. We've we've held out. We finally have are having a good season. But uh, yeah. unlike all those great seasons you've had in Boston, yeah, maybe not this year. But <laughs> well, what goes around comes around. Right. But they were talking about how. Um, the Lions Stadium and, and, and NFL stadiums like this are many of them are like this now. They're so sophisticated that um, they, they can pull because of all the cell phones in different sections that are looking up different things. They can specifically target different marketing to different sections on the TV screens and what they're viewing by the, the data from what fans are viewing while they're at a field. I, I'm, that just kind of blew me away thinking. Oh my goodness, they're able to pinpoint, you know, exactly, you know, what we want. It's that scary thing where you're talking with your spouse and then the next day, you know, you get an Amazon email recommending a book, you know, and you're like, oh, how did they know I, I wanted to read that? Well, they probably yeah, over. I mean, the issue facing most uh, businesses is not lack of data. Mm. The issue is knowing what the heck to do with the wow. data, right? Wow. Uh, right? And that's a good example. I mean, you know, you say they are targeting on what basis? The data itself doesn't tell you anything. Right. At the end of the day, somebody in that stadium, some human mm. being, has to make a decision about this ad, not that ad, this product, not that product. Um, and by the way, this will be true even with so-called artificial intelligence, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. Data itself is mute. It's only human beings that can interpret that data. And the problem that many companies have is they're inundated by data and they come up with what I would call interesting but marginal factoids mm. that don't really, they don't really get you to a first down to continue yeah. your metaphor. <laughs> that's, the big, that's the big challenge. The issue is not do we have data, do we have technology? Of course we do. The issue is what do we know what to do with it? Mm. Yeah, boy, that's, I mean, that's so important. It, kind of continuing on the, the, the Gen the Gen Z line for a second. What's really fascinating to me uh, as someone, uh, I, I've, I've spoke a lot uh, in high schools and middle schools to students and have done lots of assemblies and have been around students. I, this generation is fascinating because our students have their own followings online. You know, I mean, they're, they're a, such a unique, they're now making, 16 year olds are making unbelievable amounts of money with their online platforms, you know, it's, it's such an interesting world, you know, as we kind of pay forward, what advice would you give to someone, you know, maybe even like my daughter, 23, who's, you know, graduated from college, she's kind of stepping into her first sales position. You know, what advice would you give her as she starts off this new career in sales, especially, you know, 2023 and beyond? The advice about, a career in sales or the yes. advice about using the uh, various technologies that I, you mentioned? Well, here, well, let me, yeah, I, I, I weaved a couple of things there. I, I would love if there's any, you know, what do you think she should start with first as she's, you know, walking down, you know, learning how to, you know, sell something when she has the data available, she has the technology, you know, she has all those yeah. kind of things. What are the building blocks for her to be yeah. able to, well, I mean, I, I, that one for me is easy. And I say this not because I'm on your podcast, Jason, but you start with people, right? Yes. Uh, you've got the yes. data. Who are the people you're going to be selling to? Uh, if it's B2B, you know, do we know uh, who the uh, important buyers are, the influencers, etc.? 
the good news about technology, uh, there's absolutely no excuse for your daughter not to do her homework. Mm. Uh, you know, the data to find out that information is increasingly abundant. The second thing I would say is start with the basics. Mm. Sales in particular is very, very context specific. Mm. Selling software is different than selling professional services, is different than selling capital goods, etc. And it also depends not only on what you sell, but to whom and where you're selling it. So start with the basics. How do you run a meeting? Do you know how to do that? Uh, how do you connect with a human being? Mm. Um, how do you start a sales conversation and make the best use of the increasingly limited time that you have? Yeah. And then I think the third uh, fundamental there that amazingly trainers tend to underestimate in sales, it really, really helps to know what you're talking about. Mm. Product yes. knowledge is important. So make sure she knows uh, what she's talking about when it comes to whatever is the product or yes. service she's responsible for. Then with the technologies, you know, I, I always like to quote Coco Chanel, the great mm. uh, uh, fashion entrepreneur. Coco Chanel would always, in every meeting, She'd end every meeting with her people and say, remember, fashion is what goes out of fashion. Mm. And the same is true with these technologies. You know, an example, ask yourself, as recently as four years ago, one presidential term, how many salespeople or chief marketing officers in America could even spell TikTok accurately? Right. Trust me. There'll right. be somebody else. These platforms come and go. Fashion yep. is what goes out of fashion. Uh, for selling, it's about people, knowledge, connecting. So if you're if you're sitting in the sales manager seat, and you've got to you've got to find you know some great young or or just you know new sales yep. staff. What are some of the key characteristics you're looking for to be able to find those people who can? be knowledgeable, you know, go after people. Are there any, any common traits, you know, in, in those sales folks? I mean, well, first of all, people got to want to have the job. I mean, you know, right. uh, uh, most right. sales jobs demand uh, cold calling and it is astounding. I mean, you know, once upon a time, I believe me, I looked like Jimi Hendrix. I've got a fair <laughs> amount of experience with this, Yes, but it was amazing to me in working with um, sales organizations uh, how many people who call themselves salespeople don't like to make cold calls? Mm. Well, you know, I always quote that line in the gangster movies. Hey, you chose this life. You know, maybe, maybe you should choose another. Yes. So, I mean, there are certain basics about that. But once you get beyond that, that set of basics, I want to get back to what I said earlier. It's very, very context specific. So what does that mean if you're a sales manager looking to hire? A, you've got to understand what are the key sales tasks in your business, not in the world in general, but in your business. What's really important? Is it lead generation? Is it simply making a lot of calls? Is it understanding the difference between a prospect and a qualified mm. prospect? That's number one. Number two, where does the salesperson have the most influence in that process as opposed to what marketing can do or service or product etc and then three where they have that influence what does it take one of the one of the generalizations i'd make about sales talent in sales and this is supported by trust me decades and decades of consistent results in the research talent in sales comes in all shapes and sizes. Mm. There are stereotypes of what a salesperson is supposed to look and sound like. And what the research says is they're stereotypes. Mm. Uh, talent comes in all shapes and sizes because the sales tasks are so different. And if a sales manager really has not thought that through, then what he or she is going to do is what most of them do. 
they basically hire somebody on the basis of one or two interviews and their initial subjective impression. This mm. kid looks smart. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the research there is, is a very low correlation between the ratings people get in interviews and their actual subsequent on the job performance. Mm. So, I mean, that, that would be my answer to that. Yeah. I think, you know, important question, Jason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, turn in a corner for a second. You know, uh, it's, it's hard to get around the internet at all without hearing stuff about sales funnels, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're in sales, you've got, you know, kind of new emerging voices out there like Alex Ramosi, who's all the rage, you know, he's got the long hair and he's the muscle guy and he just, you know, produced a hundred million dollar leads and you've got Russell Bronson and, you know, all these folks with, you know, uh, sales funnels and, you know, leads. I know that that type of sales is, you know, very much targeted at let's get someone's email address and then let the email, you know, do the work. What, what do you think about, you know, this day and age of sales funnels and the success of them and, and, you know, how to make them work uh, if they're not working and all that well, kind of stuff? Well, you know, in, in some ways, as you know, the, the book you mentioned that, you know, you're looking at talks about that. First of all, the metaphor itself is flawed, mm. right? And it's a metaphor, by the way, that has dominated the way people have thought about sales for the last 60 years. And it is built into virtually every CRM system that's out there. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a view of buying that says it is a sequential linear process. I have to move them through a funnel or pipeline from awareness to interest to desire to action, yep. that yep. sequential process. But again, in an omni-channel buying world, that is not the way the buying journey works in most product categories by the third decade of the 21st century. Hmm. It's not a linear funnel, it's a series of streams where people are online and offline at multiple times right. during the buying journey. A good example of what I'm getting at. Think about all of these companies that 10 years ago were purely online, direct to consumer, and based their business on the kind of model you sketched. You know, you give me the leads, et cetera. Yep. Uh, Casper Mattress, Warby Parker, et cetera. All of those firms have either opened stores or are selling through brick and mortar retailers. Now, step back. Why are they doing that? It's not as though they woke up in the morning and said, boy, have I got a great business idea. Right. Why don't we increase our fixed costs by putting in brick and mortar? They're doing that because, again, the most important thing about selling is the buyer. They're doing that because it's required to respond to that omni-channel buying journey. So, you know, my answer is, um, I think the funnel is a deceptive metaphor. It's a different buying world out there. Sure, you can get the leads, but at the end of the day, you need to understand your business, your strategy, your yep. sales model. You know, what the old time salespeople used to say, how do we really separate the suspects from the prospects? What's right. a qualified lead? or else you're just chasing lots and lots of um, uh, uh, people who are never going to buy. Yeah. Yeah. And as you, as, as you are looking for those, you know, potential customers, I, you know, and we talked about this a little bit throughout the conversation, but the interesting thing, and, and I, I can't quote this for sure, but I was listening to a, another podcast the other day and they mentioned that the, the typical person will see about uh, 10, I'm sorry, the typical person in the Gen Z category will see about 10,000 different media messages a yep. day, you know, through TikTok and Netflix and all. So how do you, you know, you know, specific, you know, I'll just take me for example. So speak with people. One of the things that we sell is this training package, you know, for companies. And there are a lot of them out there, you know, like everybody in sales. How do you cut through all the noise? of, you know, all of those messages, all of the competitors, you know, I, yeah, I'd love your wisdom on that. Well, I mean, the, the reality is that's just tougher and tougher and tougher to do. All right. Yeah. And I don't think, I think the beginning of wisdom is understanding there is no single secret sauce to doing mm. that. 
the beginning of wisdom here is to think like a good business person. What you're describing, and you know, frankly, digital technologies are just a great example of this. What you're describing is that any one of those technologies inevitably is subject to the law of diminishing returns. Mm. And in digital, where the entry barriers are extremely low, those diminishing returns happen in a hurry. I'll give you a, a, what I think is an amusing example. Uh, right now out in Silicon Valley, there is a joke that marketing officers are telling each other. And the joke is, where is the best place to bury a body? And the answer is page two of any search engine, because nobody goes there, right? The right. single fastest growing marketing vehicle in Silicon Valley right now, as we speak, advertising on billboards. Well, there's a great 21st century technology. <laughs> well, that's, that's the beginning right. of this. And that's not going to go away. It's just going to increase. So the notion that there's one single way to crack yep. through that clutter yep. is, is not the way to do it. And you've got to stay on top yep. again fashion is what goes out of fashion. You have to stay on top of that. And it's a mistake to put most of your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about selling and either a company or an individual household has to make a buying decision. Yeah. Where do we do this with digital and where do we do it with other means? But the, the issue you're, you're uh, referring to just gets harder and harder there. I mean, that's just the, the, the business reality. Yep. So it's, so listening then it, it, it's, it's even more of a reminder for me to be so clear in, you know, the, the problem that, you know, my ideal customer has, and then, you know, to be able to be so crystal clear on how we can provide the solution. In it. Like I think if, that's right. But I think the other implication is to be, be wary of what I'd call online uh, snake oil uh, mm. salespeople. You know, here's the way to do it. Here's how you go viral. Here's the only the, way. Again, you'll see some of the research in the book. That is, uh, the, the so-called virality is by far the exception, not the norm Yes. in those channels. And, um, you know, make sure you're chasing something that you can put in the bank every quarter as opposed to the one in a million shot. Yep. And I think that's especially true, you know, because we all want to be overnight success. I was interviewing a leader the other day about uh, their book and uh, he said, well, yeah, so someone said I was an overnight success. And uh, he said, it only took me 15 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, know, that's the old that, Hollywood thing. Uh, yeah. After 20 years, I'm an overnight success. That's yes. right. <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's good. I, I can't thank you enough. The, I have ri written so many notes and uh, so much wisdom. I cannot wait to uh, get this out for our listeners. Uh, before I before I let you go, uh, and I I feel like uh, <laughs> you know I I may be sending another email in the future because I you know already have uh, asked so many thought of so many questions for part two of this because this has been just been such gold. But uh, you know we talk a lot about um, the communication speaking. Uh, you know, you've done a lot of teaching, uh, you're a professor. Who, do you have a favorite speaker? You know, someone that, boy, you could just sit and listen to them. You know, you love love what they bring, the way that they communicate. Just Is there somebody that yeah. stands out for you? Uh, no, not really. Uh, okay. I have no one favorite speaker. I can tell you the speakers I don't like. <laughs> and as I get older, the ones I like more and more. What I don't like is, uh, you know, what we call motivational speakers. Yes. Uh, you know, over the last 30 years, I can't tell you how many times I've been a speaker very often to a sales group, you know, sales company or sales conference. And the speaker before me was some football coach or brigadier general who knew less than zero right. about the company and people he's speaking with. I, I think their impact lasts about 10 minutes after their talk. So I, mm. I don't, I'm not impressed there. The speakers that I tend to enjoy the most, and it's, you know, it's, there's got to be a fit between the topic they're talking about and what they really know. The, I, and it, there's no one there. It, uh, yep. it varies by topics. Yep. No, I love that. Is there, if, if you're a podcast person or a YouTube channel, is there 
one of those, you know, either from a development end or a guilty pleasure that, well, you just love it yeah. fills you up. It's called speak with people. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> Boy, I love it. Is there, is there a book that you would recommend to, you know, an, a leader who's, um, yeah. uh, you know, just want to keep on growing and, and improving, but this is yeah, a book, boy, a book, every leader should um, read. This, the book I'd recommend was written about, boy, it's probably about 60 years ago now. It was by um, the uh, the great management guru, Peter Drucker. I don't know how many of our yes. listeners yep. remember Peter Drucker, but he really was a big deal uh, for many, many years, and deservedly so. Drucker was not only very smart, he wrote very clearly. He's a model. He would be a model of professors, if I can say so. Drucker wrote a book, I think it was back in the 60s, you know, before my time. It's called The Effective Executive. Mm. It's a book that disguises itself as one of these, you know, self-help time management books of which there are thousands. Yes. But in Drucker's case, it's not only that, it's really a book about how do you set priorities? Mm. When you're making decisions, there are going to be trade-offs. How do you think about that? And therefore, how do you make the best use of your limited time? It's it, it's a book I think anybody in a leadership position can benefit from. I love that. I love that. Well, hey, before we let you go, where is the best place we can send people to find you online? Uh, and we'll make sure uh, we post all of that. All the usual suspects. You know, there's um, uh, LinkedIn. The books you mentioned are available on Amazon. Uh, I do have a website, but I'll be perfectly honest, Jason. I haven't gone on my website in about 18 months. I really, <laughs> I really at this point, don't even know what's there. But all the other places are, uh, are places where, you know, my name will pop up. I love it. And we'll, uh, we'll post uh, all of this in the show notes. Uh, we will put your LinkedIn and links to your books. And in the Facebook group, we'll be giving out some of those books as well. Uh, just because, uh, especially for uh, entrepreneurs, for sales folks, for leaders who are in this world, ah, oh, so incredibly important, sir. Well, I can't thank, thank you. you enough for your time. This has been no, so I, rich. I, I thank you. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Really, absolutely. My best and wishes. I, I hope next year. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, only about an hour and a half from the Boston Red Sox spring training facility. So I hope next year, though, I, I've. Fenway is one of the parks I just haven't been to. So I'm hoping to get up your way to uh, see a game in person you, at Fenway. You will enjoy Fenway, but as they used to say about the Dodgers, wait till next year. We got to get better. <laughs> it was a rough year. It was, it was, it was, yeah, for sure. All righty. Well, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this fantastic podcast today. Appreciate you being a part of our listening audience. If you've never joined the Facebook group, just head to facebook.com slash speak with people and join us every single week. More and more leaders are coming together to help each other to elevate the importance of practice of healthy communication in our lives. It's so incredibly important. And lastly, if you haven't downloaded that free leadership uh, companion guide to this series, make sure you go to speakwithpeople.com slash lead with people and get your free guide today. Leadership principles from over 25 leaders from around the country. Thank you again for being a part of the Speak With People audience. We really do hope that this time challenged you and encouraged you to speak with people and not at them. We'll see you next week. Thanks.